Taxonomy is the study of how different living things are related. It's what makes saying birds are dinosaurs an accurate statement, despite many of the conversations I've seen in my comments section. Since there's still a lot of discussion, at least in some online circles, about whether or not birds are dinosaurs or not, I'm here to explain why they are, and why by extension, we're just glorified lungfish, among other things. So first off, taxonomy is generally considered short for Linnaean taxonomy, named after Carl Linnaeus in his 1735 book Systema Naturae. And his entire idea was to just break up all of nature into little groups. He actually includes minerals in it, which modern biologists don't really deal with minerals. We've, we've shied away from that part of his system, but we still use many parts of it, such as species names, genus names. So for example, there's Velociraptor a genus, but you also have multiple species of it, like Velociraptor mongoliensis, mongoliensis being the species part of it. We still use that part of his taxonomy, and it did help set the groundwork and the framework for a lot of what taxonomists do today. To start at the most basic level though, we're gonna be actually starting from the top, which is domain. Domains essentially are kingdoms, but even more expansive. So for example, you have bacteria is all bacteria. The Archaeans are another group of single-celled organisms that I'm not gonna jump too much into. And then you have the eukaryotes, which are basically every other thing that we normally interact with on a daily basis, meaning all of the animals, all the plants, all the fungus. There's a lot involved there. All of these groups are based on different traits of the cells. For example, eukaryotes have mitochondria, meaning essentially that way, way back in the distant past, they absorbed another cell and the other cell lived inside of it and became and eventually evolved into the mitochondria, powerhouse of the cell. But even still with all that diversity, you can narrow it down more. So for example, if we're in eukaryotes, you can pick a kingdom like animals and that's all of the animals. Doesn't include plants, it doesn't include fungus. So pretty straightforward. I don't, I don't know what to say to explain what an animal is. But it is important to recognize that all of those animals, they're still eukaryotes. They still belong to that parent group of the animals, the domain eukaryota. And then you can still get specific again. So for example, you can look at chordates. Chordates are vertebrates and some of their closest relatives like lancelets and tunicates. Tunicates and lancelets don't necessarily look like they're super, super closely related to vertebrates, but when you understand the four basic traits that they all have, at least at some stages in their life, it makes sense. For example, you have pharyngeal gill slits. This is the things that fish have, and even when you look further back, you can look at lamprey where there's just the little holes. It's more straightforward that way. You also have a notochord and a hollow nerve cord. They're slightly different, but help to give some rigidity to the back and also just send nerves through the body. And these are gonna to be towards the top of the body in general. And then finally, you have a post-anal tail, meaning after the butt, there's a tail that sticks out. This is why you, when you see fish pooping or whatever, they're pooping from not the very end of their body. Meanwhile, a lot of insects and things like that do poop from the end of their body. So it is a distinctive feature of the chordates. Now, the animals don't need this for their entire lives. For example, tunicates, if you saw the image that I put up earlier, doesn't look like it has any of those because they basically sit on the sea floor, just kind of pump and filter feed. But as larvae, they do have those traits. And even when we're looking at things like tetrapods, so things that live on the land that are vertebrates, many of them lost tails. We lost tails. Frogs lost tails. But importantly, when developing, we still have those features. A fetus still develops a tail. And so that's the phylum chordata, and below that you start getting into classes like reptiles, which have beta keratin skin that they shed. So you're thinking about snake shedding or even lizard shedding, it's that. But also all other reptiles still shed. So for example, crocodilians shed their skin, they just don't shed it all in one piece, rather it's just individual scales flaking off, kind of the same way that turtles do. When they're getting rid of nitrogen and waste, so essentially pee, they also use uric acid instead of urea. Urea uses a lot more water and uric acid doesn't, but when you're thinking about reptile or bird poop, it's the little white part that's there. That's the uric acid. And on that subject, birds are reptiles because like that, they still have the same uric acid when they poop or pee, but also very importantly, they have beta carotene in their skin that they shed. The feathers are all made out of beta carotene and they do shed and replace them. So it's just like any other reptile as far as many of the traits that we see. 
And sure, some of those can change, like some of the skull structures, but they're still reptiles. It doesn't change that fact. And by extension, they're dinosaurs. They have dinosaur type traits. Some of these include things like a perforated acetabulum, meaning where the hip connects to the femur, there's a hole that goes all the way through the hip bone there. In order to make sure that a phylogeny made through some kind of taxonomic study is correct, you look for shared characteristics. And so, for example, I'm gonna go to lizards now. Lizards have a number of these. For example, they shed their skin in more or less one piece. Sometimes it doesn't stick all in one piece, but it's more than one scale peeling off all at once as opposed to, like I said, in crocodilians, where it's just kind of one scale flaking off every now and then. They also have overlapping scales, meaning that as opposed to in a crocodilian where the scales are gonna be next to each other, kind of like this, instead you're gonna have them overlapping and then stacked again, stacked again, stacked again. So it's this more complicated scale pattern that's really unique to lizards. Additionally, you have things like there's a weird hole that goes all the way through the humerus bone in lizards, which you don't see in other groups. Again, a shared characteristic that we're able to look at and point at and go, look, these animals are related because they have this shared characteristic that we don't see in other animals. So we can actually try this another way. We're gonna use something that's more familiar to people and that's flatbread. So here's a list of 25 different flatbreads, where they're from, what the ingredients are, how they're cooked, and just a small list of traits. We put these breads into the program Mesquite, which is a phylogenetic program that's absolutely free. And you're able to go in and put different numbers on these traits and be able to tell the computer to make a phylogeny using these traits, see what's shared and see what's not. So you can get this phylogeny, where Don, Farada, and Taftin are the first earliest branching of the flatbreads. And then you get a couple of other ones, and then all the way very late diverging, you get tortillas and johnny cake and focaccia and lagana. So there's this large complex of them, but that's just one test. You also have this one where tortillas and ferratas are very closely related, despite being in the previous one, very distantly related. No two phylogenies are ever gonna be perfectly identical. It's just the reality of the science. And so you find a consensus tree like this one, where you can see they all branch at the same time because that's what all of the hundred phylogenies that Mesquite as a program actually found. That's what they all consistently agreed on. This kind of tree is called a polytomy, meaning that you can't really say when one branched from the other. And oftentimes in phylogenies, you'll get one or two of these. It's just the happenstance of using fossils for data. Fossils often aren't complete and we don't have the full story, so sometimes there is guesswork involved. But by adding more data points, for example, with the bread, if we added more data points for many different ingredients, we could have had a little bit more development into how this phylogeny actually worked. And that's a big part of doing phylogenetic work is the researcher themselves. Every researcher needs to make their own decisions about what traits are important to put into a phylogenetic matrix, and then how to score those and where to delineate whether or not it has the trait or it doesn't. For example, if you're looking at allosaurs and you go, oh yeah, it has a little horn over the eye, at what point is the bump too small to be considered a horn? So there's a lot of variation there and you can use exact measurements on some of these. It's just that it's not always necessarily practical because you don't always have the fossils directly in front of you. Sometimes you're working with data sets that other people made and sometimes you disagree with them. That's okay, that's part of science because every phylogeny isn't exactly right. They're all hypotheses meaning that it's a good guess that we could test further by running even more tests, more of these phylogenetic tests using more traits or more animals to try and understand. But it's not always gonna be perfectly right. We don't have a time machine to go back and look at these animals and watch them evolve into other species. It's just the reality of life as a paleontologist. And in some ways, paleontologists do have it a lot easier because when we're deciding what's a species and what's not, it's really easy to go, well, this one lived two million years before this one. They're probably different species. Those little trait changes are enough to call it something different. Meanwhile, with modern research, you have things like the warbler species complex, where just a few genes can vastly change the appearance of a warbler. So which ones are their own species and which ones aren't? It depends on how you're defining a species. There's things like what paleontologists use, which is the morphological species concept. 
there's many different concepts, but this one is basically, hey, yeah, if the animals don't necessarily look perfectly identical or don't have the same morphology in their bones, they're probably different species. But unfortunately, that also has another wrench thrown into it because, again, look at these birds that are interbreeding. They should be different morphologically, they look different, but they all perfectly breed fine and can produce any set of these different kinds of offspring. So species are complex. They kind of don't exist. I mean, they do, but they exist because we decide they exist. We're able to go out there and go, yeah, these things are or aren't distinct and that has different uses for different research. And that's where some of these older species ideas and species names get used less and less depending on what it is. For example, Trudon. Trudon is this famous dinosaur, it's on dinosaur train. But most researchers don't use it anymore because it was named from a tooth, which teeth can be pretty consistent across different animals. And it took a while before we realized, okay, well, there's the Trudon dids, this group of animals that have teeth like this. But Trudon, we can't really define because it's only a tooth. There's nothing that's distinctly unique about that tooth that other Trudontids couldn't have, which is why most researchers now will use Stenonychosaurus because we actually have bones for that one, as opposed to the original Trudon where it's just the single tooth once again. <laughs> One of the best examples of this kind of dichotomy between different species concepts, and especially the morphologic species concept and the genetic species concept, comes from the dire wolf. Because the dire wolf for a long time was thought to be really, really closely related to gray wolves, because their skull structures are basically identical in a lot of ways, just the dire wolf skull is a little bit bigger. But it lived recently enough we can actually do genetic research on it. And what the most recent genetic research on it has found is it's not a wolf at all. Based on those similarities in the skull, it was thought to be a member of the genus Canis. So again, really, really closely related to things like Canis Canis or other types of dogs. But again, didn't find that and it's probably its own genus, Anus Scion. The genetic data though suggests that the dire wolf actually split off from all the other canids super early and essentially was the only lineage of canids in North America. And then later on, the genus Canis would actually develop in parts of Eurasia and eventually migrate into North America. But this isolation makes the dire wolf entirely separate from those other animals. It's just a case of convergent evolution where a lot of those skull structures evolved the same way due to similar pressures, such as just trying to catch prey. This also means that the morphological species concept can be a little bit blind to things like convergent evolution, and you need to take that into account. And that's part of what adding so many different characteristics really helps to cover. Because sure, a few characters might be convergent, but normally not all of them are. So taxonomy and making phylogenetic trees isn't super simple, but it's understandable. First, you need to understand what the animal is or what the organism is if you're studying something that's not an animal. And then you need to decide what traits you think are important. What, what's important to you that makes this animal stand out and potentially be related to other animals. So you need to look at all of those traits and then go in, code them, decide what statistical tests to run and start running those. And then hopefully get a half decent answer that lines up with other lines of evidence potentially even other phylogenies made by other researchers. So all that is just to say that, yeah, birds are dinosaurs. They have those shared traits. Some of the closer to bird dinosaurs also have a wishbone, just like birds do. There's also that perforated acetabulum and feathers, things that we know birds have that we also know dinosaurs had. There's the uric acid in their waist that we know reptiles have. And when we're looking at us too, we know that the tetrapods really evolved from basically lungfish. And when we take that same line of logic that we used for the birds back, that means, yeah, we're just fancy lungfish that learned how to put electricity into rocks and make computers and things. So a little bit more than lungfish maybe, but lungfish are still around and so are we. No one strategy is better than the other.